you. Like some of the other speakers in this series, I spend a great deal of my time poking around in the dark and I'm fascinated by the nocturnal wildlife that's all around us. And I think it's um, particularly exciting to be talking to you today because of the status of Exmoor as the world's first dark sky reserve. And in this talk, what I'd like, like to do is why this is so important ecologically. Because in the beginning, of course, the world at night was completely dark. And in fact, the only deviation from the darkness would be the moon. But even the moon is a tiny, there is a tiny fraction of the light that can be produced by single modern street lamps. So, you know, the scale of change that's been undergone over the last 100 years is perhaps one of the most rapid of any environmental change happening across the globe. And yet it's something that most people just seem absolutely unaware of. We're so accustomed to light. We're so accustomed to going outside our houses and being able to see the footpath in front of us or being able to switch on our car headlights that we really just don't stop to think about the scale and the pace of the change. And if we just look at, um, this is a, a map of light pollution. This was um, produced by the uh, CPRE. They do their, their sky watch annually. You know, and you can see just how fortunate we are um, in the Exmoor area to be actually relatively free of light. But nevertheless, there is still, you know, there's, there's notable pockets um, of light and this is spreading all the time. Okay, if you just look at this, this map, this is flicking between 2002 and 2010. So this is um, an image that's produced based on satellite data. And you can see the scale of the expansion, particularly um, across Eastern Europe. You can see those skies are lighting up, but also changes across Britain and Ireland as well. And so profound is the impact of lighting that you can actually use it to find uh, geographical borders of countries. I'm not sure if if, the, um, if anybody can take a guess at where this is, but it's actually showing you North and South Korea there, again, based on satellite images. Really quite remarkable, that, that contrast. And as I said, the scale of the lighting is absolutely enormous compared with moonlight or starlight. So if we look just on the Lux scale, which is an indicator of the amount of, of light that's kind of calibrated against what the human eye can see, you can see that whereas the full moon is uh, down here, it, it barely registers on the scale, a residential road is delivering 10 Lux and main roads can be an order of magnitude again. Now, if we think about this long evolutionary history that animals have had of being able to live in darkness at night, it's perhaps no surprise that a very large proportion of animals are actually predominantly nocturnal. So if you take amphibians, most amphibians have most of their activity at night. Similarly, for mammals, um, most, well, about two thirds of all mammals are nocturnal. I think that's something that most people find a surprise because uh, apes are one of the few groups that are diurnal. And of course, we're, we're a great ape. And so we tend to think of the world from our own perspective, which is we're active in the day and therefore everything else must be too. In fact, there's rather few things that are active predominantly in the day. Um, some of the arboreal species are, if you have to jump between branches like a squirrel, for example, it's difficult to do that at night, so they tend to be diurnal. Most other things are nocturnal. A very high proportion of all invertebrate life um, is nocturnal, and it, again, it fascinates me. I've got many uh, very talented colleagues working on invertebrate biology, but almost all of them seem to be working on diurnal species. So, you know, if they're talking about pollinators, they're thinking of bees and butterflies. And I say, but what's going on at night with things like moths or beetles? And the answer is, well, we don't know because nobody's actually bothered looking. And finally, there are of course some uh, birds like owls that are nocturnal, but also a lot of birds migrate at night as well. And again, that's an overlooked thing that I'll come to a bit later. Okay, so 
why do people like me get very upset about light and try to get people to switch off their lights all the time? And the reason is that lighting actually completely mucks up the biology of a great many species. If you think about it, other animals have adapted their daily rhythms. So in their case, they're going to start waking up at dusk, they emerge at dusk, they'll spend the night out hunting, doing whatever they're doing, and then they go to bed at dawn, okay? You put light into that equation, they don't know what's going on you know is it now is it now daytime if I emerge from this church with those lights outside am I going to get predated by uh, kestrel sparrowhawk for example so things like bats are very hardwired to avoid lighting in fact, it was some dismay, uh, with some dismay that only the week before last, my local church is now illuminated pretty much like this one uh, every evening until about 11 p.m. And again, not a single thought clearly have been given to the bats uh, that, that could potentially be living there. So anyway, this, this work that was actually carried out in Sweden, where... Um, the investigator went back to look at churches. This is Jens Rydell. He went back to look at churches that he'd studied in the 1980s and 90s and compared the numbers of bats that he was finding when he went back later. And the results are pretty stark. So basically, these are um, locations where bats are found. The dark bars are where the bats are actually seen and the gray bars on, on top are just ones where only the droppings were seen. But basically you can see the proportion occupied declines very steeply when the uh, churches were lit. And the same thing happens in terms of what proportion are being used for breeding. Okay, so this is a big concern. If you suddenly put light in an area, you can completely alter its ecological function. And this is a real concern when, for example, you have things like you might have a barn here and you might have done a barn conversion and put in all your lovely mitigation to make sure that bats can still continue living there. But if suddenly a load of street lights appear because you've got this urban expansion right next to it, that can completely alter the way in which bats, first of all, emerge and second, can use the landscape for foraging. Okay, so we thought a bit about them uh, actually being put off from using buildings altogether, but also, as I just mentioned, it can alter the way in which they actually come out and hunt and use the landscape. So this was a study um, conducted from Bristol University where street lights were installed along uh, known commuting routes. And the summary of this is on control nights, this is what the bats were doing, the gray bars. This is the number of passes of lesser horseshoe bats, of which there's quite a lot around Exmoor. And on the nights when the hedgerows were lit, you can see that activity just basically fell off a cliff because these animals are very, very light shy. My research group have found very similar things looking at uh, comparing pass rates of bats in darkness, looking at areas where there's spill from household lights, um, security lights on garages, that sort of thing, and street lights, and then you see this pattern of, of steep decline, same for greater horseshoe bats. And if we think about what that's doing on a landscape scale, we've done some work um, putting out bat detectors in, array, in an array around a known roost, the roost is at the red point in the middle, and the blue blobs here are unlit areas and each detector had a close by detector in the light. So here, for example, it's a bit more visible where you've got uh, a yellow blob there. So yellow is a lit um, place and the size of the blob corresponds to the amount of bat activity there. And the basic take home message is wherever you are, even if you're going quite large distances from the roost, you're getting a lot more activity in the unlit place compared with a place of very similar habitat that has a street light at it. And of course, it's not just bats um, that are affected by light. Moths are well known to be attracted to light. So obviously, people are interested in actually use light to trap a separate way of attracting moths and monitoring them. But I think it's worth reflecting on the changes in moth populations and to what extent that potentially could be attributable to light pollution. So if you look at the, the state of, of Britain's uh, larger moths, what we've got is, OK, some species are increasing over time. So a few of them over here. 
and but a lot of them are decreasing. So a lot of these increases are because of increases in migratory species, and we've got spreads of, of new species to the UK. But the ones that are declining seem to be the more common garden ones. So if you like, they're the ones that are the bread and butter for things that like to eat moths. So things like bats, for example. And if we think of the ecological function of, of moths, um, I was reading that it takes about 10,000 caterpillars, moth caterpillars primarily, to feed a single brood of blue tits. And somebody's obviously done a, a back of the envelope calculation. That's something like 150 trillion caterpillars a year. So, you know, the, the potential ecological impacts across food chains are very wide indeed. And I don't think this is something we're getting a handle on at the moment. People just think, oh, it's just those bat people or those moth people that are worried. But actually, impacts on moths and other species could have really major impacts for our uh, entire ecosystems. OK, so as we know, moths are attracted to light. I mean, people talk about moths to a flame, don't they? And just as a, an aside about our shifting perception of what's normal for insect populations, you might be interested to know that originally lamp lighters were made not only to light the lamps, but also to sweep up the cockchafers and moths that were considered to be a public nuisance that lay dead in piles beneath lamps. And it's almost kind of unthinkable now that you would you would have that amount of insect abundance. That, that is the truth of it. And it's also interesting to reflect that in, in the old days of lamps, it, lamps were an expensive resource. You had to pay somebody to go and, uh, go and light them and then switch them off again. And so lamps were actually only lit on nights of uh, new moon or in the first quarter. They weren't lit during half and full moons because you could see perfectly well at that time using your own eyes. So again, it's that shift in our expectations. And just a little bit more on what happens to moths when you put lights out. This was a, a really nice study which was replicated looking at both small moths and large moths. And the black bar here is, is what's going on in terms of how much feeding the moths were doing under dark conditions. And it was compared with red lights, white lights and green lights. And basically whatever sort of light you put out, moths feed a lot less when there's light in the environment. Another similar study looking at illumination of trees in terms of what happens to winter moths. And this is looking at the numbers of females that were picked up on the trees. And again, you get massively more when you've got uh, darkness. This is both on the side. Um, so each of these lights had the light was shining at the tree and they took samples on both the illuminated side and the reverse side, the side in the shade. OK, but basically, whatever sort of light you put out, you're decreasing the numbers of females caught. And also the proportion of females that are mated go down when there's lit conditions. And that might be partly because gravid females with eggs tend to be flying close to the ground because they're looking for places where they're going to lay their egg and they're quite heavy. Whereas the males are going la 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 oh, there's a light over there, and they're disappearing off over to the light. And we know that lights will differentially uh, attract more males than females. So it's like never the, the males and the males shall meet because the, the male is distracted by the light. And amphibians as well, another group that people tend to forget are affected by light pollution. You might have been on holiday and found amphibians just sitting, particularly in the tropics, just sitting under street lights. And they seem to just kind of get captured in the cone of light. And this is quite an interesting study that exposed, uh, this is common toads, to different amounts of light. 0.1 lux, so this is basically darkness or starlight. 0.1 lux, that's pretty much full moon. Five lux, that's about half the amount on an average residential road. And they were exposed for 12 nights before the breeding period. And then they looked at, then they stopped during the breeding period and then looked at what happened. And basically the upshot is that the fertilization rate was halved in places that are exposed to this really quite low level of artificial lighting. Okay. 
So I just want to spend a few minutes thinking about the different sorts of lights before finishing up with what we can do about it. So I think the first thing to recognise is we see the world through our own visual perception. So human eyes are optimised in a particular way. So our sensitivity to light peaks around here between the green and the blue. OK, so this is what we see if I give you a band of colours. This is what your dog sees, which is why buying a, a ball painted red, you might as well have bought a brown ball. And dog biscuits are coloured for the benefit of owners, not for dogs. OK, and that's because their spectral sensitivity is different from ours. And this matters because we're radically changing our technologies of lighting. So you might remember the old days of the huge orange street lights, these ones, the low pressure sodium. They actually only produced a really small peak in, in, um, of light around this particular wavelength, which happily didn't really correspond to anything having their eyes with a peak of sensitivity at that same point. So these are probably the best you can do in terms of ecology in minimizing impact. Unfortunately, they've been phased out because there are other disadvantages around them, in particular their energy efficiency. So if you compare with the modern replacements, this is what most roads are still, oops, sorry, it's still little, the high pressure sodium. And you can see a much broader spread of wavelengths there. Once you get to things like sports pitch lighting, you get an awful lot of blue. Um, and again, if you're a mother, you will know that you want to put as much blue light as possible in your moth trap to try and attract as many moths as possible, because a lot of moths eyes are optimised to specifically seeing blue. Halogen lights, these are the sort of things on construction sites, similarly have a very wide range. Xenon in very bright car headlights, high performance cars, absolutely awful. And LEDs, well, LEDs are interesting. You can basically make whatever color of light you want with LEDs. But if you go with the cool white ones, which are, I always call them interrogation room white, and I curse every time I drive through a new development where they've, or they've changed the street lighting and it's suddenly gone to this ghastly bright white. It's ghastly bright white to our perception because it's got all this blue in it. And blue, as we know, and blue, particularly if it tends towards the ultraviolet, is particularly bad. OK, so this is the, an example of the colour change. So this is old fashioned, well, fairly recent, high pressure sodium, the pinky light. And that's what it looks like if it changes to a white LED. That's what it looks like. This is Milan from the, from the sky when they change to white LED lighting. OK, so. I just want to give you an example of, of where colour matters. So you might be aware that there's an awful lot of migration of birds that happens across the North Sea. These are uh, flight paths here of bird migration routes. And it was noticed that birds were being attracted to um, gas rigs and oil rigs, which are lit. So you can probably almost see them from the moon. And basically, as time went on after the lights are switched on, you get massive numbers of birds circling and often landing completely exhausted on the deck. OK, and so an experiment was done to see whether this could be modified by playing about with the lighting. Um, so it, it went from this is what it started with through to a China greeny sort of lighting. And the basic upshot was that as you went from white to, to red to green to blue, you had progressively less impact on the birds. So you were getting much less attraction happening. OK, and you might think, great, happy days. We just turn all the lights blue. The problem is, though, that different species have different sorts of light perception. So while blue is great if you're interested in birds, blue is not so great and green is not so great if you're interested in fish or um, interested in bats, because both of those are actually find that colour quite attractive. But anyway, it does. I just want to flag really that the, the whole issue of light pollution is actually quite complicated. And I've been involved in doing some work testing uh, red tinged street lights to see if that could be used as an alternative way of managing the problem. And the bottom line is you're better frankly switching your light out rather than trying to fiddle with spectral composition. Okay. Um, Another thing I wanted to mention is sky glow. So often our skies are very polluted. So this is the orange haze that you often see over large, um, large conurbations that you can see from a distance. 
And obviously Exmoor and the other dark sky, dark sky reserves are particularly valuable because they don't have that reflected light going up into the sky and you can actually see the stars. And that's really important for things like enabling birds and other species to be able to use the stars for navigation. However, interestingly, it also means that when you put in new lights, then the effect of that individual point light can actually be worse in places that are actually very dark than if you're in an area that's already pretty light. So this is comparing um, the uh, attraction to light of leopard moths, males and females in dark skies compared with light polluted skies. And this is some work that we looked at where we looked at putting in street lights um, in these are on A, B and minor roads and the A roads were by and large pretty, pretty well lit already as were the B roads, whereas the minor roads had very, very few lights on them. And what we found is minor roads are super attractive to bats on the dark nights, whereas the other roads really aren't. Most self-respecting bats don't actually want to fly down a dual carriageway or a really heavy road of heavy traffic. But when you add the lights, when you go to the, the white bar here, suddenly the numbers of, of bat passes really declines. So in other words, it means that even in a dark sky area, you really need to be thinking about the impact of those individual lights. It might be, again, somebody's security light that they just haven't really thought about it. And now it's illuminating the next door field or the next door four fields or, you know, a light at a junction and those sorts of things. Right. So. I'm going to finish now, I think, about what we're going to do about this. I think the first thing is we can think a lot more creatively about planning and where we're going to put new development, new roads, new lighting, so it can minimise ecological impacts. OK, and thinking about things like if you know you're going to have a load of roads here with with headlights streaming across here, maybe you need to be putting in some sort of physical barrier to actually stop that light trespass into woodland, into adjacent fields and so on. We've also been doing some work of looking at, 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 at some modelling work where we're combining data on things like the light and the, the habitat suitability to produce what we're calling resistance layers, which are kind of modeling how, how difficult it is for bats in this case to move through a landscape. And we put all those together to come up with a, a multivariate model. And what that can do, this is actually Barnstable here. Um, the red here shows you the paths which bats uh, are most likely to use. And the black triangles are showing you the locations of the streetlights. I think what you can see really well here is how those streetlights completely sever those uh, favoured routes. And so actually what this can help with is saying, OK, you don't have to take out your entire row of streetlights, but perhaps if you did something about those ones there that are interrupting uh, that particular flight path, then that's a way of managing this situation. OK, and another thing that we can all do is think about what sort of light fittings we actually buy. And it always amazes me that you could go into uh, any shop, you know, you could go into B&Q or Homebase and all those, and you can buy not only light fittings that are, you know, millions of candle power. Why does anybody need that? <laughs> and secondly, you can buy things that are just really, really ill designed. So what is essentially bad is a globe light and often sadly these are the kind of traditional looking lanterns and things like that because the light is just going everywhere you've got your little person down here but most of the light isn't used in a useful way at all it's going up into the sky okay whereas the best is something that's well shielded where the light is going where the person actually needs it so just a few examples of truly awful lighting would be this sort, this sort of thing where you've got light uh, directed vertically upwards and downwards. It's not really providing any great function there at all. It's also made worse by the fact that it's against a white background. So if you put any light on a white background, again, think about people who go out moss trapping. You know, often we use a white sheet or something like that, don't we? Because it helps uh, to attract the insects. We just don't want to see those. Similarly, Illumination of trees for architectural effect, um, deeply worrying. 
there's also just a, a whole load of random sort of light fittings. This was, I was just happened to be picking up my children one night from a sports pitch and I started to think how mad the lighting was there. You can see this piece of this light fitting there. Most of the light is going upwards. It's not going where you want it to be at all. Similarly, you've got lights here that are sending the light directly outwards. There's steps here that were actually really badly illuminated. And also don't necessarily low level lighting means that it's, it's better because a lot of bollard lighting is actually really poorly directed. It, so it's low in terms of it's not high, but it's not necessarily low impact. So you might be better with a taller structure with very well, um, a very well focused cone of light going where it's needed rather than this low level bollard that's kind of shooting light all over the place and leaving lots of gaps which can then be hazardous for people. I think we also need to think much more about building control and enforcement. There's a real trend for glass buildings and one of the problems with glass is people tend not to use, not to draw their curtains and the glass is also reflective as well so you've got light bouncing all over the place. In this case, it's also reflected in water. So any development that's close to water, whether that's a river or a sea, is also a concern because of that mirror effect. And don't think we don't have to worry about that in Exmoor because we don't have any sky rise blocks. What we do have is a trend for lots of modern architect design buildings with acres and acres of glass. And I can tell you, because I've been involved in some of these sorts of developments and gone back in horror, a year or so later to realise that these windows are completely unshielded at night and the light is just going everywhere. Okay, so I'm going to finish there and, you know, basically my message to you all, if there's one thing you do, it's pull your curtains and switch off your lights. Thank you.